Commentator says, looking for James, he's got it. Coming to the end of the third quarter, LeBron James, a shot in history as the ball arcs into the air. There it is. LeBron James stands alone. The NBA all-time scoring record now belongs to LeBron James. It used to belong to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was that man applauding with little enthusiasm. Like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar snatched the all-time point-scoring record in 1984 from Wilt Chamberlain, who scored 31,420 points in his career. Kareem then played another five years, scoring approximately 7,000 points. That is, un of course, until LeBron broke into the NBA and stole what was long considered to be the unbreakable record. And just like that, with one swoosh of the net, Kareem, sit down. As the commentator rightly said, LeBron stands alone. The question now, of course, is for how long? Until someone else comes to steal that unbreakable record, which he's never going to lose. It's 2023, and we all have an opportunity to grow spiritually this year. In fact, if we're born again, if we're Christians, if we are the church, we could make the case that Jesus commands that we grow this year. And the good news is, God's mercies are new every day. So today, we have an opportunity to decide to change our thinking if we need to. And we have the opportunity to align our life with our new mind and walk in an act called repentance, walk with God. Repentance means turn around, change mind, change direction. Repentance is not just something we do when we come to see Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We do at that point, there's new birth at that point, but repentance is something we all need to do often, if we're honest. Real often, turning around from a misguided direction or a little off course or way off course, turning around to face our Lord and walking through life His way in step with His Spirit. Then we grow. We grow by adopting and maintaining spiritual disciplines in line with the truth that is God's word empowered by his spirit you see we human beings are I think we'd all agree both physical and spiritual beings and there's an interplay isn't there between our physical actions sometimes and our spiritual effectiveness or even the effects our actions have on our spirit that's prevalent in our journey toward being growing people, knowing people, our mission here at Maruba Baptist. We are looking at how to grow over these weeks. Last week we looked at, uh, we talked about our need, as Megan said, to take rest 
and guard rest. What a beautiful God we have who's not a slave driver but actually wants us to rest. Rest in him, of course. What a way to approach ministry and mission, to rest. That's a protection for burnout. And it almost doesn't mean we need to slow down often. What a way for us to approach this new year. Maybe we all need a rest. Well, take one, plan one, guard it, and keep taking it. Are we resting in Christ as we do God's will? Or are we restless? as we continue to try to manufacture our will for our life. Taking and guarding rest is one of the ways that we grow. Today we look at a second way that we grow, and that is giving. Growth happens when we practice giving. And to be clear, our spiritual growth that we have in view here is Christ-likeness. If we're going to be growing people, well, we're going to be giving people. That is the likeness of the one who gave himself for us. Growing people are giving people. So the question is, well, give what? I can see it coming. What do we give? Money. Time. Talent, our gifts. God's given you gifts, all of us. All of us have gifts that he wants us to give for the body. What do you think God desires the most that we give? He desires from us the most, our hearts. Because God wants our hearts. He knows if he gets our hearts, he'll get everything else. And by the way, he needs nothing else. But he wants our hearts and has demonstrated that on a cosmic historical scale, hasn't he? The lengths he's gone to for our hearts. Hosea 6.6 says, I don't want your sacrifices, your money, your time or your talent. I want your love. I want your heart. I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. To know him is to love him wholeheartedly. That doesn't sound like a desperate God looking for money, does it? He certainly does not need money from us. (laughs) He gave it to us. And yet God, don't get me wrong, commands us to give generously money. He commands us so that we won't give ourselves to money. That destroys us. Money is surely a big and strong element of our giving. But friends, it's only an element of our giving. And the call to give our money to God's bride, the local church... That's not for God's sake. That's for our sake. The act of giving money to the church is actually one of the most precious gifts God has given us. When we give money, that's a gift from God he's given us. Now, it takes a growing person to see that. And many people see that here. This is a generous church. We give sacrificially and praise God for that. Praise God for that gift that we give sacrificially here. But it becomes more and more clear as we grow. Giving is a, an integral part of our growth. First and foremost, God wants our hearts. When we give God our hearts, all other giving, money, time, talent, is the joy that it should be. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. Jesus said to an expert in the law, probably trying to catch him out, asking what are the commands. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's it. 
first and foremost, your soul and with all your mind, wholeheartedly. This is the greatest and most important command. That's what he desires the most. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Now we can hear the selfless nature of the Christian life in those commands, can't we? That's how we grow. Giving. Love God more than yourself and love your neighbor as much as yourself. Give yourself fully to God and one another. Every command to give time, talent, money, all of that will not only be made easier, but a joyful pursuit in the Christian life when we give our heart to God first. The Christian life is one in which we grow more and more like Christ. That is growing people. And giving is a part of it. Why should giving be central to our growing relationship with God? Why give him anything? I mean, it's ours. We've worked hard for it, right? We've collected. We've been wise. We've saved. We own. We've got it now. Like, why give it to him? What is the claim that we should give? Well, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that uh, we are, in fact, his possession. We have, as born-again people, as Christians, we have been bought with a price. Now, Peter goes on to tell us in 1 Peter what that price is. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. So, was the life of God's Son that precious blood of Christ given for us a gift worthy of a response, do you think? Of course. But I want to make something clear here today. There is nothing we can give God or anyone else that would be a worthy response to such a gift as precious as the blood of Christ. We can't give a worthy response. We may simply receive that gracious gift, not pay for it or pay it off or earn it. It's priceless. All we can do is humbly receive that gift and praise his name. We don't want to get into a mindset in our faith journey where we think we owe it to God now to give to him because he gave us Christ. It's a little deception, but it's a deception that can actually bind and, and lead to a performance-based uh, discipleship or worse, a guilt-driven religion. We don't owe God because he gave us Christ. That is trying to put a price on the infinitely priceless gift that is Christ. Furthermore, as I said, our giving to God is actually his gift to us. He gives us grace to be able to give with a joyful heart to him. So when we understand that, when we give to God our money or our time or our talent, we know that it's a gift of his grace that we can. So if hypothetically, hypothetically we were trying to keep a ledger, right? So we've received Christ, now we owe God. So we've received Christ, now we're going to give. Now every time we give, he has to give to us grace. So now we're incurring more debt as we give. The more we give to God, the more we're indebted to Him. 
through grace gifts. Because our giving to him is a result of his ever-increasing gift of grace to us. We don't owe God. We can't. If we owe God, there's no hope for anyone. Who's going to meet the payment? So I hope we see today that our giving to God is not because we owe to him. That insinuates the price on the priceless blood. But what we see in the Christian life of growing people is an opportunity to respond appropriately, we might say, to the indescribable and priceless gift. And I think the appropriate response is to treasure him more than anything else by far. That you would just give your life in a second. Where do I sign that paper to give my life? The martyrs have done this for thousands of years and we are to do it as living sacrifices daily. So, what should be our response to the God who, 316, we know it, love the world in this way that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. That's us, the born again, the church. What's appropriate? Response to the God who gave his son, to his son who gave his life, to his spirit we've been given, and the everlasting life his spirit gives. What do you think might be an appropriate response to him? if not giving ourselves fully and entirely to him from our hearts first and flowing from that all things, I'd say we missed the mark. I think we're being inappropriate. Growing people are giving people, essentially. Jesus gives us a clue how the Christian Life looks, this life of giving and growing. This is foundational. He says in Matthew 6, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is a supernatural shift. Christians are capable by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to make this shift. It's in our hearts and minds and it's foundational for a life of growing through giving. The world doesn't know and cannot know and would not in their right mind make this shift. It wouldn't make sense to the world who don't know God and hope on him. I think even Christians find it hard to be perfectly honest to make this shift. We know we should, but it's not easy because of our flesh. Not getting, achieving, not collecting and storing and dusting and polishing all the treasures we can amass in this life because we're giving our hearts and everything we hold to God. Knowing that there is waiting for us an eternal treasure that we're laying up in doing so of an imperishable gift that will never fade and primarily that gift has been given to us. It's Christ precious blood of Christ it takes faith not to store up for ourselves treasures on earth where new models are released every year and friends and trends change every week and reels are relegated to forgotten footage every day that require another post to update our presence and our status 
where cars crash and bodies break and LeBron James comes and steals your unbreakable record that you were meant to hold forever. Even as earthquakes open up and swallow your apartment building. It takes faith not to give our lives to and hang our hopes on these fleeting treasures but rather store up treasures in heaven and the foundation of that element of our faith is Matthew sticks just believing it to be true we're storing in heaven there's an imperishable gift for the life of faith so give it up give everything up even your very last breath if you need to Because verse 21, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. If we're growing people, our hearts are with Christ. That's paramount. Remember, growing in view here is becoming more like Christ. So our hearts are in Christ and we're giving people. And so our treasure is with Christ. It is Christ, but it's with Christ, stored up in a future hope. And don't get me wrong, there's plenty to enjoy right here, right now, right? Rest, all things. The only way we can is giving our hearts. So, what should we give? Money isn't nearly enough. If we just give money, God can use it, but he wants our heart. Money is not nearly enough because there's gifts he's given us that we're not giving for the body. Time's not nearly enough if we're not giving money. Are we saying now that God's hiring us on the clock and he owes us a, a, a wage? So I'm not going to contribute money to your kingdom Lord I'll contribute my time instead that's got to be worth money so now God's got you on an hourly wage so to speak we're to give all things all things are his how do we give to him we give our hearts to his causes namely touched on it last week that his kingdom comes he taught us to pray this way his kingdom comes his will is done on earth as it is in heaven that's his cause we give everything in and through his church his bride we are the church what are we going to give collectively what are we going to give individually in our golden opportunity with this life, however long it's got left, to lay up something imperishable for his glory. What are we going to give? We give everything. What are we planning to give God this year in and through his local church here at Maribra? Adam Alton is a photographer a journalist, I was reading about him this week. He's, a, he's in Turkey. Um, I was looking at one of the photos that he took weeping. He said the photo he took on this cold morning this week um, was more impactful than any of the tens of thousands that he's taken in his 41 years of shooting pictures. Picking his way through the aftermath of the 7.8 magnitude earthquake, he came across a collapsed apartment complex. Families digging through the rubble and searching for buried loved ones. And there was a man in a bright orange coat. Some of you may have seen this photo, like one of the council, you know, fluoros. He sat quietly amid the debris with just like a lifeless look on his face defeated 
he was alive, but he's defeated clearly. Um, what caught Alton's eye when he looked closer was that this man was holding a hand. He took the photos and um, the man he came to know was a man named Mesut Hansa. And the hand that he was holding was that of his 15-year-old daughter, Ermac, who had been killed in her bed when the quake caused her building to collapse. Now, this photo was a photo of rubble against a cement wall, like he was sitting against that cement wall. And out from the wall was a quarter of a bed, which I imagine was the top half of his daughter, and he was holding her hand, expressionless. That pain is almost unbearable to witness, right? How about live through? The, the Turkish-Syrian tragedy has obviously caused an angst around the world, as let alone the people there, but the world is in angst. The world is in pain. And so I prayed, and I've been praying and thinking about what should our response be? God, what should our giving response be to this tragedy? Do we try to give money to Turkey, to Syria, as a church? I thought, what does that even mean? Who is Turkey? Who is Syria? You know, um, the government, is it? Or are there people we know? Then I thought about the many millions of dollars and tens of millions of dollars that will no doubt come from foreign aid, from governments, from the world at large, from philanthropists. And I thought, well, what could our giving be, Lord? At Maroubra Baptist. Can we rustle some money together? Is that what we want? I mean, no one's booked to go over there anytime soon. And God pointed out two things to me this morning. Firstly, we can give something as the church that is far more powerful and effective than any money It's what God wants from us over and above our money. It's our heart and our hearts in prayer. The church's unique offering for Turkey and Syria right now is to, become, is to come before the Lord of all power and all provision and infinite riches and all sovereignty and have our hearts broken before him appealing to him and interceding for them, appealing to God's merciful healing and deliverance. And I did. And I prayed that his angels, who I know are on site, would make their way down into the depths of that rubble to be with people and reveal him and comfort them. He's there. Let's pray and intercede for them. Secondly, God reminded me that our mission, our mission, Maruba Baptist Church, in his kingdom is primarily local. Primarily local. And then I was prompted to give to mission. And he showed me how. This week, Neil and I were talking about the Turkey um, incidents and as we were talking, I said, Neil, it's 11.30. Did you bring your lunch? No, sweet. Okay, cool. I've got a Turkish friend. Come with me for lunch, and we'll go down, and we'll actually check on them and see if they're impacted and, and you know, just tell them that we care. And so we said, great, good opportunity. We went down to the princess table. Dear friends of the church, we've been going there for years up until the recent past every night after our evening service, sometimes taking 20, 30, 40 people there. 
we went in there and I saw our good friends, Varkas, the son, Ajdan is the father who just <laughs> sits around and probably tells him how to do it. We went in there and connected and gave our condolences and just to check, like, are you guys okay? They said, it's in our area. That's where we are, this, this town. We came to know that they lost 20 or 10 to 20 friends or family lost. Ajdan had been there just a few months ago. He might well have been there in the collapse, but he was there a few months ago working on his house. His house, which he was so close to going over and retiring in with his family and friends who probably are no more. His car crushed as his apartment came down. I dare say it probably wasn't insured. If it was insured, I think he'd be on the back of a long line, which he may not live to see, get rebuilt. They'll probably hear of more loss this week. Money's not enough. Our hearts are the only response that's appropriate to God and God's people as we love him more than ourselves and we love others as much as ourselves. That's growing people, knowing people. So at 3.30 a.m. this morning in the shower, God gave me a plan. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about the motivations for giving uh, to the saints albeit but the motivations for giving and in 2 Corinthians he says you will be enriched in every way for all generosity you want to be generous God won't leave you short you'll be enriched both through it and for it which produces thanksgiving to God our generosity produces thanksgiving to God through us for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints or anyone else for that matter in the name of God but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Two points of that verse jumped out at me. One, we will be enriched in every way for generosity. As I said, we will have something to give and we will get something from giving. If we want to give, we can all participate in it. For our God will supply it if our hearts are with him. And two, our giving produces thanksgiving to God through us. Let that overflow. So, the plan God gave me was for next week after church I'm going to go and have lunch at the princess table my whole family so you might not want to come <laughs> no my whole family and I hope many of my church family will come I want to just see if I, the invite is for you if you want to come after church to eat at the princess table and before that, I'll be fasting from Saturday night. I'll be fasting through the morning. I'll break my fast there. I'll be praying for them. I don't want to notify and note that I'm fasting, but I want to encourage you, there's that option too. I'll do it with you. Fast and prayer, intercede before the God of all mercy. And um, I want to give more, I want to give encouragement to this friend who we've had for many years who is suffering greatly and has no hope as far as I know. I'm going to give him prayers. I'm going to write him encouragement from scripture. I'm going to have a book at the back of the church. If you come, come prepared. Come with cash. They only accept cash. Turkish. Come prepared with something to write down of a prayer or a hope from God's word. Write it in there. I'm going to go with whoever will come, present it to him, dine with him, well, in the restaurant, 
and personally I'm going to contribute something of finance in an envelope which you're welcome to do as well for if you want to do that there'll be an envelope you just tell me and we'll give it to him I thank God for that plan that's a gift he gave me because I was in angst I felt like I couldn't make a difference to Turkey or Syria or anything like that I knew I could pray and that was powerful and I yearned to do more and God gave me the gift to be able to do more so if you want to do more in that way with me let's do it together next week if not feel free to share what you're doing